Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video. And today I have some books to recommend to you that are what I'm going to call over-the-shoulder narratives, or in other words, books that aren't about their narrator. So, this may seem quite a specific thing, but this is the kind of book that I really, really enjoy, where the narrative is told from the perspective of one person, either in first person or in close third person, but actually the book is not about that particular person exactly, it's more about someone that they are observing throughout the novel. This is something I actually really love in literature, I really love books where the narrator is not necessarily the main character, although one thing that I especially enjoy about these books is the way in which the narrator's observations of the main character also tell us things about the narrator. So I have 12 books or book series to mention today, all of which kind of follow this um, structure in some way, where the narrator is not exactly the main character. Some of these are classics, some of these are contemporary books, all of these I really enjoyed and highly recommend. So the first few are all classics and I want to start off with Wuthering Heights. Now Wuthering Heights is a fantastic Victorian novel which tells the story of the complicated messy dynamics between two big important families in this um, rural place in Yorkshire. The first half of the book mostly focuses on two members of the Earnshaw household, Cathy and her foster brother Heathcliff, who have a very complicated relationship. Um, and then the second half of the book follows um, the kind of second generation following on from the first characters that we follow. But what I find incredibly interesting about Wuthering Heights is its narrative structure. It has a very complicated narrative structure with a lot of stories within stories within stories, but at its heart we have kind of two layers of over-the-shoulder narrative. So we begin with a man called Lockwood who comes to Wuthering Heights and we see Lockwood observing the Heathcliff and the family at Wuthering Heights um, and learning more about them. And he, in order to learn more about them, um, calls on his housekeeper, Nellie Dean, um, and then we get the rest of the novel mostly from Nellie Dean's perspective. Nellie Dean was a servant at Wuthering Heights. She knew Cathy and Heathcliff um, and the kind of second generation leading on from there. And we follow the story of Cathy and Heathcliff and Catherine and Hareton and all of the other characters through Nellie Dean's perspective. But the book is not about Nellie Dean, although we do learn quite a lot about her through her observations on the characters. We don't focus on her life at all, even though she is the narrator of the bulk of the book. One of my favourite things about Wuthering Heights is its complex narrative structure and the way we're kind of always at a distance from the main characters, the people we're really following, because we're seeing them from one step removed from the perspective of one of their servants. Um, and one of the reasons why I think none of the television or film adaptations I've seen of Wuthering Heights have ever been very good, in my opinion, is because it's very hard to make an adaptation of a story where you never see the two main characters alone together, um, because you're always seeing it from the perspective of someone else. Um, so it doesn't make for a great film or television adaptation, but it makes for a brilliant book. And I love the use of the over the shoulder narrative in Wuthering Heights. Another Victorian author who uses this technique a lot is Elizabeth Gaskell. Um, so one thing that always springs to mind to me is the novel Cranford, and it's set in this small town um, where all of the kind of people above a certain social class and above a certain income are women um, and all the women are kind of the main important society of this town. And our narrative perspective in Cranford comes from not one of the women in Cranford but from a younger woman who has come to visit her friends in Cranford. But the story is not about her, the story is very much about the ladies who live in Cranford um, and is always focused on the other women around her and our narrator is not actually that important, we don't know that much about her at all um, and the details of her own life are very very limited within this book which I find fascinating I think it's a really really interesting technique used here I think it does make it not the best place to start with Elizabeth Gaskell because it is a bit different but I really enjoy how we're seeing Cranford slightly from the outside from someone who knows it well who loves the people who are there but who isn't a part of that community and who is also a lot younger than the people in that community I love Cranford a lot I would highly recommend it it's very very funny um, and just a brilliant read there are also two of Elizabeth Gaskell's novellas where she uses this really interesting technique. One of them is My Lady Ludlow. Um, this is a really interesting novella. Um, I love some parts of it, the middle is a bit of a slog, um, but it basically tells the story of this woman called Lady Ludlow who is a very complicated character in many ways. She's a woman who is quite conservative, who is sort of backward thinking in many ways, who doesn't always approve of everything that's going on in society around her, especially of sort of social ability and things like that, but she is also 
a woman that is quite easy to understand and that is characterised in a really complex and wonderful way. But the story is not told from the perspective of a Lady Ludlow, it is told from the perspective of a young woman who comes to live with Lady Ludlow. And one of the things I find fascinating about Lady Ludlow is the sort of complicated character study of Lady Ludlow, but also the way that we learn more about the narrator kind of in passing. The narrator herself is a really interesting character and um, her sort of health begins to fail her throughout the book and she's suffering from some kind of disability or chronic illness um, and that I think is explored really well but it's never really at the forefront because what is at the forefront is Lady Ludlow but also in the way the character talks about her experiences living with Lady Ludlow you learn a lot more about her as well so it's a really interesting novella and one that I would definitely recommend. And another on a similar vein is Cousin Phyllis. This I think is slightly less clear cut than the others I've mentioned so far but Cousin Phyllis follows a young man um, who is starting at the beginning of his career and he meets um, his cousin Phyllis and the story is effectively a complicated relationship and love story between his cousin and one of his friends that he is an observer to. He is not part of the main plotline as it were but we do see how he kind of comes of age um, and learns more about himself through witnessing the relationship between these two people who he's close to. So the story is kind of about them but we do learn about him through the way he observes them as well. The last Victorian novel I want to mention here is John Halifax Gentleman by Diana Bullock Craik. In John Halifax Gentleman our narrator is of course not John Halifax but a boy and later a man called Phineas. Phineas we meet at the beginning as a boy and we follow him into his adulthood um, and mostly throughout the book we follow his friendship with John Halifax. Um, he meets John Halifax at the very very start of the book who is this other boy in the neighbourhood. John Halifax starts off um, as a kind of travelling workman who has no prospects, no money, no income um, but through Phineas's friendship for him Phineas manages to kind of help him get his foot in the door of the world um, and John Halifax kind of raises himself throughout his life. And and throughout John Halifax Gentleman we follow the life of John Halifax um, and how he kind of rises from his beginnings. We follow John Halifax's coming of age story, we follow John Halifax's career, we follow John Halifax's love story and we do also follow Phineas and we do also learn more about Phineas but Phineas throughout the no narrative as John Halifax kind of becomes more and more important Phineas fades more and more into the background um, until in the second half of the book he isn't that important to the story at all, although his love for and his affection for John Halifax is important still, actually the book becomes more and more about John and less and less about Phineas, but the very fact that that happens tells us a lot about Phineas because Phineas loves John and John has such an important presence in his life that he's almost more important in his life than Phineas is himself. It's a really fantastic novel in many ways and I found it really engaging and really moving in places as well but I do think the character relationship between John and Phineas and the way Phineas observes John is fascinating. I feel like I can't make this video without mentioning the Sherlock Holmes books by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The, the Sherlock Holmes books follow Sherlock Holmes and the way that he solves all of his mysteries but of course with the exception of one or two short stories the Sherlock Holmes stories are not told from the perspective of Sherlock Holmes they are told from the perspective of his companion Dr Watson who is not Holmes and is very different from Holmes who doesn't observe things in the same way as Sherlock Holmes and who doesn't understand what's going on which is in many ways a really interesting decision narratively because as a reader of many mysteries, especially more modern mysteries, we expect to be able to like guess some of what's going on as it's happening. Whereas when I read the Sherlock Holmes stories, I never have any idea what's going on at all because Dr. Watson doesn't know what's going on at all. And only Sherlock Holmes knows and we don't get to see inside his head. So we don't know until the very end what's happening. But actually it works really well and it makes them really fun um, because there's always a clever solution even though you could have never been able to see it coming and also because you get to see this amazing character of Sherlock Holmes from a distance which is important because most of us feel more like a Dr Watson in life than we do like a Sherlock Holmes. I love the Sherlock Holmes books a lot and I'd highly recommend them and I think they're a very interesting um, series that uses this particular narrative device. The next one I want to mention is another classic and that is The Great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby is an American novel from the 1920s. It's narrated by a man called Nick but it mostly focuses on the kind of complex messy relationship between a man called Jay Gatsby and a woman called Daisy who is Nick's cousin. 
Nick is in the background in many ways in this story, although we do learn quite a lot about him as well, especially through the way he observed Gatsby and Daisy. Um, but this book definitely doesn't focus on him and focuses more on um, Gatsby as a person. Like in many ways, this is, you know, it's called The Great Gatsby. It is about Gatsby and the kind of narrative drive and the narrative arc of it is mostly about Gatsby. But of course, we're looking at him one step removed and everything is kind of being observed by an outsider, which as I have been saying throughout this video is something I really enjoy. The next one I want to mention is a book series and that is The Dance and the Music of Time by Anthony Powell. Um, I'm just holding up the last three in the series for you, but there are 12 in total. This is a wonderful book series, um, all of which are following a man called Nick through his life, from his sort of teenage years into his old age, from the 1920s to the 1970s. The books were written from the 1950s to the 1970s, so they span a huge chunk of um, British history, which I find absolutely fascinating and they are following this man called Nick but they are not about Nick they are about all of the people that he observes around him especially a particular man called Whipperpool who is sort of very very different to Nick um, and Nick has a kind of complicated relationship with where they're not exactly friends but Nick possibly understands Whipperpool more than some other people do and they kind of meet each other again and again throughout their lives um, and in many ways the book series is more about Whipperpool than it is about Nick but we also see Nick's observations on I mean probably hundreds of other characters there are so many characters in A Dance the Music of Time I love it a lot I think it's a really wonderful series and one of the things I really like about it is that the narrator takes a back seat they're not about him um everyone around Nick is kind of um subjected to huge kind of psychological analysis effectively um nick is analyzing everyone around him but he's not analyzing himself you know later on in the book series nick has children and we don't know the names of his children his children are never named in the narrative which feels really strange that we don't know the names of the narrator's children but because the focus is always away from him and his personal life it does make sense and actually it works fantastically and it's one thing that i really really love about the series and i also kind of love piecing together the little details that you do know about his life and his personality and his character from the way that he observes other people and what he says to other people. Even within the dialogue within A Dance of the Musical Time, often um, other character speech will be in speech marks um, and what Nick says is just, um, we just told it without speech marks. Even in, within conversations, what he's saying is really kind of pulled back um, and is not given the focus, which I find fascinating. It's a really, really fantastic way of doing a book series and it's really interesting um, definitely something that I really enjoy. The next one I want to mention is another book series and that is the Cicero Trilogy by Robert Harris. I love these books I think they're absolutely fantastic. I read them a few years ago and just absolutely adored them. This trilogy is set in ancient Rome and follows the real historical person of Cicero who was an important political figure at that time but of course it is not told from the perspective of Cicero it is told from the perspective of his slave Tyro. There are so many things I love about this series. Tyro is definitely Definitely my favourite character. Tyro is a really fully fledged character in his own right um, and I read the books for Tyro more than I did for Cicero but I don't think that's the case with most people who read the series um, and Cicero is a fascinating character too and he is definitely the focus of the novels um, and he is the one who drives the plot along. One of the things I love about this series is the relationship between Tyro and Cicero um, and the complexities of that because they are really close friends but also Tyro is his slave um, and no amount of friendship can change that. It's a wonderful series in so many ways, but I love the way that Tyro observes everything. And I love the way that we learn more about Cicero, both sort of from a distance, but also from a place of love that sometimes probably makes us more kindly disposed to him than we might otherwise be from Tyro. It works fantastically. Um, and I think it's such a brilliant device in that series. The next book I want to mention is the novel Goodbye Zagumi by Banana Yoshimoto. I love this book so much. I think it's a really, really fantastic novel, um, one that I just completely adore. In this novel our narrator is a young girl called Maria who is going for the summer to stay with her cousin Zagumi. Zagumi is the main character of this book absolutely. She is the personality that enforces itself on this book. She is capricious and um, spoilt, 
cruel at times but also absolutely fascinating and um, she's also struggled with illness all of her life um, and Maria worries a lot in this book about losing her. But this book is in many ways a coming of age novel for Zagumi and also we see Zagumi finding love and how that changes her but we're seeing all of this from the eyes of her cousin Maria who loves her and is enthralled by her but also at times finds her very difficult um, rather than seeing it from Zagumi's head herself. In many ways I think it really helps in a novel where the central character is very complicated and at times not always likeable to see them through the eyes of someone who loves them despite everything because that makes you understand them and love them more as well um, and that definitely works really well in this novel too. Of course we are learning about Maria through um, the way that she sees Zagumi and she is coming of age in the same way as Zagumi is as well even more so through watching the way Zagumi changes. Um, there are so many things I love about this book. I think it's a really fantastic novel um, and definitely an interesting one in this category as well. The next book I want to mention is Dark Water by Elizabeth Lowry. I read this back in March and found it really interesting. This novel follows a psychiatric doctor in the early 19th century in America, but it's mostly not about the doctor. It is actually a lot of it more about a man called William Borden, um, who he meets on a ship when he is serving as the ship surgeon, um, and who afterwards is committed to the asylum where our narrator works. This novel, like many of the ones I've mentioned, is one of those where we learn more about the narrator through the Way that they interact with and think of the characters around them um, and it's a really interesting novel for being one where you feel like the narrator is just a uncomplex blank character with which to observe Borden and as the novel goes on you find out that there are more things going on within our narrator's head than we are ever aware of but I also find the way that this book examines the character of William Borden through the narrator's eyes um, and through the narrator is really really fascinating. You'll notice that in lots of the books I'm talking about here I'm telling you the name of the main character but the name of the narrator who's observing the main character I can't remember because that's not what's important in this book. What's important in this book is more William Borden and the way our narrator feels about him and towards him um, even though he is himself an interesting character in his own right. This is a really fantastic read and definitely one I would recommend. The last book I want to mention today is the only one I'm mentioning here which is not in first person. This is um, a book where there are various different close third person perspectives on one particular character and this is the novel Olive Kitteridge by Elizabeth Strout. I read this book a few years ago and really really loved Loved it. It is a novel in the form of short stories and all of these short stories are in some way about the character Olive Kitteridge. I think there is one, maybe two stories which are from the perspective of Olive herself but nearly all the stories in this collection are other people outside looking in on Olive um, even if she's a minor point in the story. She is what connects all of these stories and we see how everyone perceives her and how various people perceive her differently through the narrative structure. I really really love Olive Kitteridge for that. I think it's a fascinating book in the way that we get to see all of these different perspectives on Olive and, and get to build a full kind of idea of her through all of these different people and all of the different ways that they feel about her. So there we have it, those are the 12 books and book series that I wanted to mention today where the narrator and the main character are separated um, and we're getting a sort of outsider perspective on the main character. I really really love this form though there isn't a neat and concise way to say it. I think it's a really interesting narrative device and definitely one that I enjoy. So there we have it, that is all for this video. Please let me know down in the comments if you have any other similar books to recommend me where um, the main character and the narrator are not the same person because I really really love them as you can tell and that's it for now thank you so much for watching and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video